Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be beautiful in your sight. O oh Lord, our Creator, and our Redeemer, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. We are almost done with our meditation through the Lord's Prayer. We're on the next to last week. And there's something that's kind of funny about this week because we come across the phrase that most of us pray first. If we're not... If we're not guided in our prayer by the Lord's Prayer. You know, most of us, our first, our first prayer is, God, show me the way to go. God, what's the way? What's the way for me to go? And what I want you to know is, is that, this, that this section will lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is part of the Lord's Prayer. It's part of. Meaning that it's really there, and it's something that we need to pray. But it's not the whole thing. So often as Christians, we can get into thinking that this is the whole thing. The whole thing is, is just about um, you know, God leading me personally. Where, where should I go personally? And um, when we take the Lord's Prayer seriously, we see that God does care about that. But there are other things that come before that. One, um, one lover of God wrote it this way, the prayer lead us by itself or first can betray a, a real selfishness, a too quick desire to get on with it, an, an unwillingness to face up to God's major concerns or to face the world's present needs and our past guilt. He goes on to say that there may be things more important in the world than our leading, such as the honor of the Father's name, the coming of God's kingdom, the performance of God's will, the feeding of the hungry, or right relations and mutual forgiveness among the community. The Lord's Prayer teaches priorities. The Lord's Prayer teaches us priorities. As we've been meditating and sitting with the Lord's Prayer, one of, our, one of my hopes has been that, that we stop saying the Lord's Prayer and that we start praying the Lord's Prayer. Because it's so easy to say the Lord's Prayer and not have it come from the heart, not have it touch your heart, not have it go through your heart, not have it form your heart. But this is what prayer does. Prayer forms our hearts. It's so easy to say the Lord's Prayer. It's so hard to pray the Lord's Prayer. And one of the things, one of the reasons that it's hard is because so often we first and we only pray, God, just show me what, show me where I need to go. What's your direction for me right now? By praying the Lord's Prayer, we are helped to keep God's priorities to be our priorities. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. It's a while before we get to this phrase. It takes a while before we get to this, this prayer to ask God to deliver us to not lead us into temptation, to, live, to deliver us from evil. But, but it's still here. And the fact that it's later on doesn't mean it's less important. Um, a couple things I, wanna, I just want to uh, get at. And the first is this phrase, lead us, lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. What does that mean? Why would Jesus tell us to pray, lead us not into temptation, as if... God might be leading us into temptation. The other places in, in the book of James, it tells us that God um, never himself tempts anyone. So why would Jesus say, don't lead us into temptation? I want you to think of a picture. Um, um, the idea that the into is something like, it's a, it's a, spatial, it's a spatial thing. 
the spatial sense, meaning the picture is going into the sphere of something's influence. Okay? When you come into the sphere of something's influence, you come under that influence. So when Jesus is saying to pray, lead us not into, in effect, he's saying, lead us over temptation. Or, while we are being tempted, don't let us come under the power of a temptation. The temptations were something that that the people of Israel, the, the Jews, knew a lot about. They knew a lot about it. The temptations um, of being, of wondering, does God care? Was something that the Israelites spent a long time walking with. A long time walking with. Um, and our scripture today is working with that sense, that sense of deep history, of a knowledge of being tempted in the wilderness. <clears throat> it's also a commentary on the Lord's Prayer, as, as Trudy alluded to. Let's turn our attention to the Word of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the first 13 verses. Listen to the Word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, I want you to be sure of the fact that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all went through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, and they all drank the same spiritual drink. They all drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. However, God was unhappy with them, with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. These things were examples for us, so that we won't crave evil the way they did. Don't worship false gods like some of them did, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Let's not practice sexual immorality like some of them did. And 23,000 died in a single day. Let's, let's not test Christ like some of them did. And were killed by the destroyer. These things happened to them as an example. These things happened to them as an example, and were written as a warning to those of us who would come at the end of time. So those who think they are standing need to watch out, lest they fall. No temptation has seized you that is not well known by all people. But God is faithful. He won't allow you to be tempted beyond your abilities. Instead, with the temptation, God will also provide you a way out so that you will be able to endure it. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's part of being God's people to know what it is to be in the wilderness. This is true for Christians today, too, right? You know what it's like to be in the wilderness? Ever been there? I have. When you're in the wilderness, you wonder, does God really love me? Does God really care? Does he, does he know? Do you know that Jesus felt that too? Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Do you remember at the very beginning of his ministry? Jesus was tempted. He was led out into the wilderness by the Spirit. He was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. But he was led into temptation by Satan. It's a difference. The Spirit of God does often lead us into the wilderness. But in the wilderness, when the temptation comes, we are to pray. Lead us not deep into temptation. Lead us not deep into the, the, the effects and the power of temptation. But deliver us from evil. Do you know why Paul can say that we, that God will never give us more temptation? Do you know why? It's, it's because the Holy Spirit has been given to you. The Holy Spirit is in you. 
then what happens is Jesus' life is put into your life. And you know what happened when Jesus faced the temptation? He didn't give in. He didn't give in. He made it through. He was not given over to the power of temptation, but he was delivered through it. And friends, it is the Spirit of God who unites you to Christ that will give you, that has given you this power. Because Jesus has already gone through ahead of you, you can too. That's what we are invited in to. To be filled with the power of the Spirit. To, be, to have Christ's life given to us and to be able to walk through it. Have you ever been given a hug by someone you love? I have. It's a good thing. It's a really good thing. Have you ever um, been told, I love you, by someone that you love? That's nice, too. I need both of them. You know, with my, my relationship with, um, with Kristen, I need to hear her say, I love you. And sometimes I just need a hug. Friends, when we come... When we come around the word, like we have done just now, we hear God say, I love you. I love you. When we come to the table, we feel God's hug. They work together. They both tell us that God loves us, but they do it in different ways, the same way that hearing the words, I love you, communicates I love you differently from a hug. You need them both. You need them both. I'm so glad that we are coming to the table. And this table, God is doing something in the world. God is doing something in the world, and you're invited to come. You're invited to come and be part of it, but don't come if you want to remain the way you are. Don't do it. Only come if you want more of Jesus in your life. Only come to the table if you want to be changed from the inside out, the Holy Spirit filling you and giving you the power to stand up to temptation, to go through temptation, to be in the middle of temptation, but not to come under the power of it. That's what it means to come to the table. Coming to the table is saying yes to Jesus, to the Jesus who has said yes to you. Do you want that? I want it. I want it for you. I want it for the world. Because the world is different. The world's a different place when people say yes to Jesus. It's a different place. It's a better place. So come to the table. Stay rooted in the vine. Because that is how being connected to Christ, you are given. You have. The ability to, in the middle of temptation, not come under its power, but like Jesus, to walk through it. And I have a father, someone else here.